Good afternoon. The session chairman, Kabra ji, other dignitaries on the dais, Chetan bhai, Johnny Jain, the past central council member, Jay Charya, chairman of the Surat branch, the next faculty, Kapil, a lot of seniors I can see, so many ji, and a lot of seniors over here, my childhood friend, Jinendra. It's very pleasure to be here amongst you in this Surat specifically. Koi bhi central council member ho, agar usko apni constituency mein aana hai, to wo hamesha ready rehta hai. So agar koi bhi invite kiya, to he is always ready with you, whatever may be the topic. And it's immense pleasure. Specifically, this is my first visit after getting elected to a central council member. And I should congratulate uh, the Professional Development Committee for organizing such a wonderful uh, national conference and hosted by the Surat branch. So my special congratulate to the chairman and his team for doing such a wonderful, with a, such a wonderful audience and in such a large numbers, which we find it difficult even in the city of Mumbai to gather such a large numbers. If when we are hosting a national conference in Mumbai, it's really very difficult after COVID to gather the large numbers. And that's what I feel, that's the, what the spirit of the Surat is. And obviously, it is obviously the topics which has been selected by the branch is also wonderful. And therefore, I'm sure yesterday would have been a very great learning experience. And I believe today also you will be happy with the programs which have been conducted. The session which Sunil Bhai has set is really very wonderful. He was marvelous, which he covered. And I'm sure for it's a challenge for every speaker to be that now. Uh, so with this particular background, uh, as a Central Council member, I thought it would be my duty to brief you about certain activities, being especially I need to deliver a lecture on international tax. And I'm also a vice chairman of direct tax committee and international tax committee. We used to have two committees separate, which have been merged from this year. So it's a double role of a direct tax committee and international tax committee. So I'm a vice chair of that. Uh, on a direct tax committee front, two or three important things which we are working upon, which may come up, which may uh, kick a light in uh, next uh, two to three months. Most importantly, the annual exercise which we will be doing is, uh, which we have already started, the groups have been made, is revision of guidance note on tax audit. I believe this would be the last tax conference, anything, because hereafter the practice season will start, 31st July, 30th September. And therefore, it becomes very necessary for the committee also to come with the timely direct tax guidance note, especially guidance note on tax audit. Uh, we, did never, we had a guidance note which was last revised in 2014, but it was revised in 2022 after eight years gap. Uh, and we thought it necessary that because of these frequent amendments which are happening, frequent case laws which are coming, it is necessary that we should keep on amending, maybe yearly or maybe uh, once in two years or something like that. So we will be amending, uh, I believe that by end of July, we'll come with the revised guidance note on tax audit. Similarly, the most important, everybody would agree, the changes which have been made is in account of charitable institutions. Changes in section 10, 11, 12, and also the changes in the audit report format, which has increased. If somebody is actually uh, going to look into 10B and 10BB, which is a audit report now to be issued in case of charitable institution, which is much wider in scope than the Form 3CD. And therefore, the committee thought that we should come with an implementation guide. The first draft is already worked out. Uh, the group is working on, review is going on. Uh, obviously, our intention would have been to come out with a guidance note, which has a better authority when the authority of publications of the councils are concerned, which is a sort of a mandatory. Though implementation guide is not a mandatory, but the idea behind the implementation guide is to guide the members and take a view, take a decision where there could be a contrary views, there can be difference of opinion. So what the group feels, what the experts who have been engaged in preparation of this implementation guide, what is their guidance, could help in members in taking a decisive uh, action, uh, what should be done. And more importantly, all the members will take a similar action. That's what an idea is when we come with an implementation guide. Ultimately, idea would be that this implementation guide gets converted into a guidance note. Uh, which requires an exposure draft uh, of 21 days, a public comments, comments of all the members will be taken up. So initially, because the time is short and we believe that guide should come before September, implementation guide is expected to come before end of July. So uh, it can be helpful to the members during discharge of their audit functions in August and September. That's what an idea is. 
and but ultimately uh, it would get converted into a guidance note which will have a mandatory status sort of and therefore uh, that would uh, implementation guide will also as good as it can be taken as a mandatory though it may not be an authority of the publication uh, third very important uh, as a part of direct tax committee we are continuously engaged with uh, cbdt and the government obviously it has been felt uh, in last 4 uh, 5 years that the engagement as far as committees are concerned or the engagement of the institute with the government is concerned is not so good or government is coming with certain guidelines they are come with certain revisions and institute is actually implementing it and uh, there is no uh, prior uh, consultation which is happening so at uh, this stage what we have decided we have already formed a committee on revision of form 3 cd so as a proactive measure uh, our committee would be suggesting that the form 3 cd should be revised and that suggestion will go to the cbdt and it would be our endeavor that those suggestions are expected the idea behind suggestions in the form 3 cd is everybody knows that the object of tax audit is uh, that the, it helps the assessing officer in drawing up the correct computation of income so there is it is necessary that certain clauses which are missing should come in certain clauses which are redundant should be deleted and it should be more comprehensive as far as which is not been covered so that is another area which we are working upon along with government along with income tax department which has already approved uh, the emails would have been received by the various committees a tax clinics will be organized by our institute in one of in its 168 branches on july 13th and 14th of july the idea behind tax clinic is that uh, two or three chartered accountants members from our institute the of from our branches would be uh, available over there for the general public to create awareness amongst the general public that why should they take a pan why should they file return why it's simplified so ultimately the objective of department is to widen the tax base and the idea of this tax clinics jointly with the income tax department is to work in tandem with the income tax department on increasing the tax base widening the tax base that's what an idea so i thought this is three or four important areas which uh, direct tax committee is working upon uh, before coming to a technical session i would also like to because somebody raised the question on overseas network guidelines so i thought i will answer this as my first uh, question uh, though it was raised to the previous speaker the past president that whether the overseas networking is permissible or not and the honorable past president also mentioned that uh, certain action has been taken the matters is already subjudiced before the disciplinary committee also but i am not on that question is what has happened is not been uh, question important is what is coming what is forthcoming there is already a group formed at the council level to review its networking guidelines and not only the local networking guidelines but also overseas networking guidelines and the institute are uh, when they approved then uh, recip on reciprocity even the audit practice in case of uk and canada for the purpose of incorporating in free trade agreements which government is proposing to sign with this particular countries institute is aware that it is a time that we should open up even our audit practice obviously reciprocity is the important we cannot open for them unless and until it is a free access available to our indian chartered accountants abroad and with that in with that in the mind even the overseas guidelines are been drawn so fta may have been entered only with the two countries like uk and canada in times to come and it depends upon the government policies also it is only the one service area that is audit which government generally will seek an opinion of the council and the council has already approved that but as far as overseas guidelines is concerned overseas network guidelines is concerned believe me is very shortly a new, new guidelines will come and it would be a forward looking whereby the institute believe that its members should be able to access be a network partner of an overseas entity or maybe an overseas uh, body which helps them in accessing the overseas market number one helps them in getting a knowledge sharing about the overseas guidelines and that is what an idea is so i believe that will be coming up which was a certain questions raised by two or three members earlier also so it would be in the pipeline i am sure it would be great even uh coming to now my topic which is obviously a technical session on uh, paradigm shift in international taxation now international taxation it is a quite a big area uh, to cover in 45 minutes to 50 minutes would be quite difficult 
So I discussed this with the chairman, what should I do basically? What would be your address? So he said, okay, you can try to cover uh, the basic provisions of the non-resident Indians, more concentration on individuals. And what are two or three important aspects wherein the shift is happening? And it came to my mind two or three things which is happening is, uh, of course, section six, uh, subclause 1A, which came in two years back. And that was an important shift which happened in case of uh, non-resident individuals. So I thought I will try to cover that. Of course, it's a, this may cover. So during my presentation, I may move it a little faster, which, uh, which may be a regular basis of how 182 is to be calculated, what are the non-residents, residents, NROR. So I will move a little quickly on that. But the idea is to refresh it. But believe me, international taxation is quite a vast scope. And uh, of course, Kabraji said that abhi pe to kaam bacha nahi hai. So we have to see international. But I, I, I would have a different view, Kavraji. Uh, I believe that next two decades would be of Indian chartered accountants. I, I, I definitely believe that. Next 20 years. Uh, there is a lot of, uh, you may believe that when RERA came in, when RERA came in, a uh, lot of developers, every gully was a builder in our Bombay. So a lot of people got more regulated. And a lot of small shops who could not actually, who were only doing construction without having a technical, practical expertise, actually closed down. Uh, chartered accountants see the way it has been regulated. I know it has been regulated very strongly now. We are unstable to various regulators, and that is hurting each and every professionals, including me. It hurts me because I have been regulated by various bodies. I am subject to peer review today. I am subject to FRB, Financial Review Board. I am subject to Quality Review Board. Uske baad upar se nafra beta hai. sab cheez hai. But only positive which I can look at it today is obviously the once the quality goes up, the quality goes up, definitely the business is going to grow. The audit is going to remain a very important subject because that is, in fact, a lot of people believe that audit is still a monopolistic of chartered accountants. Institute of Chartered Accountants. Nobody else is able to do statutory audit when it comes to. There may be certain other areas wherein like social audit which we came up and suddenly SEBI also included CMA into that and we are fighting with that. But as far as statutory audit is concerned, as far as audit of financial statements is concerned, obviously we are the, the if, if let's take an example of transfer pricing audit which has to be done in case of international tax transactions. The chartered accountants are obviously a monopolistic, and believe me, nobody, I, I don't see anybody can replace us, because long ago, if, if uh, there was a national tax tribunal was supposed to come, NTT, and uh, Madras High Court and ultimately Supreme Court also dropped it, because national tax tribunal permitted, permitted the chartered accountants to appear before NTT, and NTT was at a par of the High Court. And one of the remarks was mentioned that if you are not, uh, uh, only because you are studying a law does not mean that you can actually argue on the law front. That was an argument made before the Madras High Court and they confirm it, ultimately confirmed by the Supreme Court. But I also believe there is also a judgment of the Madras High Court in the income tax department, in the income tax matters, which says that the audit is sacred, audit report is sacred. When it, when it means sacred, that it cannot be rejected without finding a fault. Once the accounts are been audited, they are sacred. So that's the status which court also recognizes today also, that if it is an audited by a chartered accountant, the assessing officer technically who is, does not know what audit is all about, he is not competent technically to actually reject those audited accounts unless and until there's a very specific reason that yes, the accounts are really not properly drawn. Otherwise, just for sake of rejection, they cannot do it. And there are various judgments. I think a couple of sitting here who is also quite updated, much more updated, I believe, on the latest judgments. And he will also address that or he may address other issues also. But the audit is going to remain and that's why I have a different uh, uh, thought process on that. Coming to an international tax, when we talk, obviously, uh, past president spoke about why we should move abroad. Obviously, I would feel that sitting over here, you would feel you would have a much more also opportunities and that's why we need to learn international taxation. And that is the course of international tax conducted by institute, which is a very deep dive subject. It's just not a cut and razor. If you do that particular course, you would realize a lot of people are into international taxation. Cross-border transactions are going up. Digital transactions are going up. Complications in international tax have changed. Somebody would feel that we are not doing an international tax practice. But I believe in this particular hall, everybody is into an international tax. 
एवरीबडी इज फाइलिंग अ रिटर्न ऑफ नॉन रेसिडेंट गुजरात में तो ऐसा होता ही नहीं है हर घर में नॉन रेसिडेंट है यहाँ पे मोस्ट ऑफ इफ यू गो टू नवसारी तो वहाँ पे तो हर फैमिली में नवसारी सूरत अहमदाबाद आनंद टू बेस्ट ऑफ माई नॉलेज एवरीबडी इज फाइलिंग इंडिविजुअली हु इज प्रैक्टिसिंग सिटिंग ओवर यर इज फाइलिंग अ रिटर्न फॉर अ नॉन रेसिडेंट so you cannot say that i do not practice international taxation we do practice international taxation in day in day out while filing a simple return of income for a nri you are supposed to look into the provisions of section 5 section 6 section 9 you have to be aware of whatever changes are happening and therefore there is an application of the international taxation at every point of time and therefore it becomes very important that we actually look into it keep on refreshing this and that's how i look at it this is going to expand cross border transactions are been increasing day by day as mentioned by kabra ji when the cross border transactions happens if it is happening with associated enterprises transfer pricing comes in there's a lot of scope in that transfer pricing it's it's not that transfer pricing or it or a transfer pricing study which has been done can only be done with a big four it's not like that we are much any individual small medium enterprise also can provide that services i'm sure you are, you may be a much more cost effective and therefore that scope in india will definitely remain as in when from all cities wherever you are residing as in when your client actually becomes global obviously he would require the services of international tax he would require you just take an example of the gift city which is coming up over here and the there was a gift city meeting uh, with the prime minister which our president also attended and that was for the development of the gift city and the government is very positive that all the funds which are located abroad maybe at the foreign countries like ua mauritius why they are not coming to the gift city and therefore they also want that the chartered accountant should advise their clients on this you can be a proactive if you are advising some international investors obviously you can be a proactive you can suggest them that why they should come to the gift city that could be one of the opportunity how you can save taxes how you can save on the currency exchange rate differences and so and so forth so that i believe that there would be a enormous scope obviously we have to be equipped in whichever new areas we are going into it uh, of course taxation is a traditional area but largely even today 80% of our practicing members across india across india are surviving on their tax practice and more specifically to direct taxation it remains though the gst may be the numbers may be more but the revenue wise direct tax still remains a very specific because if you see the from the government perspective direct tax collection is higher is almost compared to a gst collection which was not there 20 years back direct tax was low but the indirect taxes were high but now it remains more or less similar it's almost 50% of the total revenue collection and therefore direct tax is going to remain important institute has already merged direct tax and international tax committee idea is that each and every member should be equipped should no international tax provision usko choice mein nahi chhodna hai exam paper mein section 6 7 8 9 ko chhod diya aisa nahi hai you have to know that and obviously as i said everybody is practicing so with this i will go to my technical presentation on my concentration would be on the individuals as i said uh, what i will try to cover in next 35 40 minutes is of course residential status in india section 6 is an important poem that is very important for purpose of tax liability in case of companies dual residency that is shift which is happening there were the situations where an individual was not resident of any country so he does not stay 180 days in any country he stays 90 days in india 90 days in uk 90 days in ua and he doesn't become a resident of any country uh, he is is a resident of no no land basically so what happens in such cases section 5 scope of total income which is again dependent upon your residential status section 9 what is income deemed to accrue or arise in india which is taxable oecd pillar 2 model very important just to give you the idea where the government and worldwide oecd is moving what's an idea if you will just understand pillar 2 very briefly i'll just touch up just to know what is there in store in the future what is the vision of the all the international bodies all the international tax regulators basically a recent shift in international taxation and scope for ca which i'll try to cover so very very quickly types of resident everybody is aware basically we have a an in for in case of individual and hf you may be a resident or a non resident if you are a resident you need to decide whether you are resident 
and ordinarily resident ROR in short, or RNOR. These are the three categories. You are said to be a resident in India if his stay in India in that previous year is greater than 182 days or more. Or, so there are two, if, if you are more than 182 days, you are definitely a resident. Even if you are less than 182 days, but if you are fulfilling and another condition, then obviously you are a resident and you don't become, so it's greater than 60 days and 365 days or more in four previous years. The 60 days has to be read as 120 days in particular cases or maybe 180 days. If you fail to meet both the above conditions, that's it, you are not staying in India more than 182 days or you have not been in India in that particular year more than 60 days or 365 days or more in the four previous years, you become a non-resident. 60 days in the previous criteria is relaxed in certain cases if Indian citizen or the person of Indian origin is living for employment outside India as a crew member in a ship or who comes on a visit in India in any previous year, who comes on a visit to India in any previous year and has income other than income from foreign sources in excess of rupees 15 lakh, then 60 days has to be replaced by 182 days. In case of income which is less exceeds 15 lakhs, then it is replaced by 120 days. So you may remember there was a changes which were made two years back, wherein the 60 days criteria was increased to, uh, which was available up to 182 days in certain cases, which was reduced to 120 days. In case of certain Indian citizens or person of Indian origin whose income in India was more than 15 lakhs. Here, after certain election was given, which said that even if it is more than 15 lakhs, he may be treated as resident, but not ordinarily resident, which means that the income from the foreign sources would not be taxable. If he would have become a resident, his worldwide income would have been taxable. But after that particular relaxation, because he becomes RNOR, resident, but not ordinarily resident, even if his income is exceeding rupees 15 lakhs, his income from foreign source would not have been taxed. So this 182 days, uh, 60 days which was replaced, which is 182 days in certain case, which was reduced to 120, day, 120 days, there was certain relaxation given. In case of Indian citizen having income other than income from foreign sources in excess of an INR 15 lakhs and not taxable in any other jurisdiction. This is the shift which happened and the new subclass 1A was inserted, which I just briefly mentioned. That, let's take an example, an Indian resident who, Indian citizen who is not resident in India because he is not staying in India for 182 days. He stays in UAE. But in UAE also he does not complete 182 days. He may not become a resident of that particular country and may not be liable to taxation in India. There's a different story whether there is a taxation or not. The question is whether he is liable to taxation in that particular country or not. So he stays 90 days in India. I stay 90 days in India, 90 days in UAE. 90 days in UK, 90 days in USA. So virtually it was happening that he was not actually been a citizen of any country for the purpose of tax and he was not paying tax anywhere. And therefore the new section was inserted that in case of, that is we call citizenship based. So if an Indian citizen he is not liable to tax in any particular country because of the residential tax residency provisions over there, he is not completing 182 days over there in any of such countries, he would still be liable in India based on 61A. Again, the question was initially when it came, this was applicable only if your overall income in India exceeds rupees 15 lakhs. Not in case if your income in India is less than 15 lakhs, then this obviously provision do not arise. But if it exceeds rupees 15 lakhs, it was applicable and he was treated as a resident whereby the world income would have been taxed. Thereafter, it was again amended in the same year. There was a difference between the Budget and the Finance Act, stating that he would be treated as RNOR, whereby the foreign income would not be taxed, but the Indian income continued to be taxed as if you are a resident. So, example of 6A1A, Mr. X, an Indian citizen working with an overseas company located in Dubai. During previous year 21-22, he stays in India for 55 days and his total income other than income from foreign source is INR 22 lakhs. Will Mr. X be considered as a resident in India? X is in India for 55 days during previous year 21-22. He is unable to satisfy any of the basic conditions given by section 61A. However, he, However, he satisfies the following three conditions. 
by Section 6.1a, Mr. X is an Indian citizen having total income in excess of rupees 15 lakhs during the relevant previous year, and he is not liable to tax in any other country or territory by reason of his domicile or residence or any other criteria of similar nature. So it's above 15 lakhs in India. He is an Indian citizen. He is neither domicile, he is not resident in any particular country. 61A will apply. He is deemed to be a resident, but not ordinarily resident in India. RNOR, def ROR definition, a resident person will be considered as resident and ordinary resident if resident for at least two out of ten immediate previous years and is residing for at least 730 days in seven immediately previous years. So I'm just quickly considering the, I'm trying to just brief it, take a cut and reserve of this international tax. I already got a chit that we have a very short time, so we'll uh, try to complete it faster. Uh, the question that arises, sometimes uh, it may arise that uh, uh, you may be in a situation wherein there is a very shortfall period that whether 182 days is happening, what, whether you should consider the date of departure and date of arrival needs to be included in calculating number of days stay in India. So there is an advanced ruling which says both the days should be included. So if I am departing today, it should be included that as if you are staying in India. And if I have arrived today, in today's date, half day I may be here, half day I may not be here that should be considered. Whether self-employment outside India is covered by explanation one to section six one. So if you are living for an employment outside India, then the residential provision of 60 days is not to be taken, it is taken as 182 days. So if you are going for a self-employment, so if you want to start a practice and you go abroad, you go to UAE, you start the practice during the year, you go into the July, so you may be not staying in India for a 60 days period, then whether the 182 days period should be considered or not, that's an idea. Yes, employment, in case of employment, it's 182 days, even a self-employment is covered. Whether a deputation of employee outside India is covered by explanation 1 to section 61, in case of Ram Sagar Chaudhary, there's a judgment, old judgment, it held individual who leaves for deputation are also covered. So this is for the increased period, basically whether 60 to be covered or 182 days. Whether foreign tools imply, imply employment outside India, it refers to a permanent postings and do not imply employment outside India. Section 6.2 and 6.3 deals with in case of HUF firm BO, the residential status in case of this is dependent upon the control and management where it resides. If the control and management of any per such legal entities resides in India, they would be treated for the purpose of taxation in India. Similarly, in case of the company, if it is incorporated or registered in India, if it's an Indian company, it's a tax resident. If it is not an Indian company, but if the poem, that is place of effective management is in India, it would be considered for the purpose of taxation as a resident company. So you may have an UAE company, you may have a company incorporated outside India, but it is controlled by the directors completely sitting in India. So the, we have a lot of companies such, you may have a clients, they have a subsidiaries outside India, individuals have incorporated some company at the foreign locations, maybe free zones, but the control and effective management is completely from India. In such cases, because the poem resides in India, it would be treated as an Indian resident. Poem, for the purpose of poem, refers to where the key management and commercial decisions necessary for conducting a company's business activities are made. There are the criteria, you need to understand first what is the active business outside India for the purpose of the poem, whether that can be brought into India, whether your passive income, wherever earned is not more than 50% of the total income, less than 50%, so there's a criteria of 50% of the total assets and 50% of the passive income for the purpose of determining whether you have an active business outside India. In case you have an active business outside India, if it fulfills all these cumulative conditions. If it is outside India, then obviously, and if it is controlled, then you need to be a poem, you have to be beware of that, take care, if the poem comes into India because of the active business outside India, then you are not to worry, but if active business is not there outside India, then obviously you need to worry. I'll just go into the skip. Uh, place of effective management, there can be a lot of categories, but before that I would like to cover section nine briefly. Dual residency, which I have again, we have already touched upon, subclause 1A, a person can be a resident of two countries, that is a dual resident. So I may be a resident of India also, and I may be a resident of any other country, let's take UK, UAE. 
However, due to applicability of DTA, you may be taxed in both the countries. Now, the question arises whether there would be a double taxation. So we have an agreement entered between various countries that is double tax avoidance agreement. That double tax avoidance agreement, there is also a residential status which has been determined under that. So there can be a tiebreaker. You may be a resident of the two countries. If you have the resident of the two countries and you have a DTAA between the, both the countries, you may have to apply a tiebreaker rule, which is dependent upon whether you have a permanent home, where is the center of vital interest, where do you habitually abode, where do you stay regularly, nationality of the country, mutual agreement procedure. So the dual residence, you may have to be determined. In absence of DTAA, if you do not have a DTAA signed with a particular country, the person may be taxable in both the countries. However, a unilateral relief may be granted by filing form 67. So you may get a tax credit, you may get an uniform relief to that particular extent. Section 5 is the scope of total income. Why it is important to determine residential status of any particular individual file, filing the return? Because the taxability of the various source of income depends upon its residential status. So if I am an, an Indian resident, obviously my worldwide income is taxable. It's taxable in all particular case, whichever income deemed accrues or arises or is deemed to accrue or arises in India. So section nine covers income deemed to accrue is taxable in all cases irrespective of it, whether whatever is your residential status. Income received or is deemed to be received similarly is taxable in case of all categories of individuals, whether it's resident, non-resident or RNOR. Income accrues or arises outside India. So only benefit available is which is an income arises outside India, but business and profession is controlled or set up in India. So it is controlled from India, though it is actually business, uh, business has actually been done abroad, but it is controlled from India. It would not be taxable only in case of non-resident, otherwise it's taxable. In case the income is also controlled and set up outside India, then only it would be taxable in case of residence. So if I'm a proprietary concern of a business which is set up in USA, in because a proprietor is controlled by me in India, my total income of that proprietary concern would also be taxable in India. We need to be cautious about because I know of lately a lot of companies have been incorporated. I know the companies, small, small companies are also opening an LLC in USA. Online jate, $250 my company open ho jati hai, aapko Amazon ka registration mil jata hai. Once you are registered on Amazon, you can actually sell abroad online. So a lot of people are doing this, not realizing that these companies are technically controlled by India. If they are offering for taxation in India, that particular income, no problems. But otherwise they become a taxable because those companies, those LLC so-called which are open, which are paper companies, are, tax are completely controlled from an India by an individual or by a director sitting in India. Deemed income, income deemed to accrue or arise in India. Section nine deals with income deemed to accrue or arise in India. Now in this is any income which is deemed to accrue or arise in India is taxable in case of all type of individuals, whether it is a resident, whether it is a non-resident, whether it is RNOR. So what are this, any income which is, basically it's divided into any income which is from a business connections, property situated in India, a set or source, or a capital asset in India. So if the, of course, capital asset is in India, any income is generated from them, irrespective of the non-resident would be taxable. If the, so it's a, it's a real base, when we talk of an asset, if the, the situs-based taxation, if a asset is situated in India, it would be taxed, irrespective of the foreign citizen, is the non-resident, it would be taxable. Income under the head salaries, if it is earned in India, or is payable for the services rendered in India, only to that extent, Salary payable by government of a dividend paid by an Indian company outside India is also taxable, subject to a lower tax rate depending upon DTAA. So if an, an Indian company is paying a tax rate, paying a tax, paying a dividend to a foreign non-resident Indian, whether it's a taxable, yes, it is taxable. It would be taxable at a regular rate of 30%, but if it's a resident of that particular country and the DTAA is entered, then you have a concessional rate available you may come and across a situations where the banks, like State Bank of India, they are distributing dividends to a shareholder situated worldwide. And they are also seeking Form 15CB from the, our members, that what would be the tax impact on that particular case. So whether it, if they, you may have to examine DTAA, 
if any remittance is happening because of the dividend or even even a private company if you have a foreign shareholders who may have to look into it because it's taxable interest payable by government of india or by a resident or a non resident so any indian payable interest payable royalty payable by government of india or by a resident or non resident so even paid by the companies you may be aware that royalty has been taxable at 10% now it is paid to a foreign company it may be paid to a non resident but because it is paid by an indian company once it falls within the definition of section 916 small 6 roman 6 it is taxable in india because it is deemed to accrue or arise in india and you may have to deduct withholding tax the liability on the indian payer is as far as is concerned is for withholding the tax applicable rate which was 10% under section 9 now it has increased to 20% by the last budget but it may be 10% or 15% depending upon the countries with whom which is dtwa is entered because certain countries provide for 10% capping certain countries provide for 15% capping in the initially there was no issue when section 9 tax rate was itself 10% fees for technical services fts payable from india again that would be covered under under income deemed to accrue at arise in india there's a huge role in this wherein form 15 cb is necessarily required to be issued by a chartered accountant and therefore when i said every individual chartered accountant wherever there is a remittance happening nowadays we know there is lot of remittance happening there is already tcs come in of course for it's that's for an lrs that's not for the business expenditure but there is a foreign act wherever the remittance has to be made abroad they require a chartered accountant certificate in form number 15 cb please mind it before issuance of 15 cb you need to have a basic knowledge of the provisions of section 9 we need to rule out that it is not taxable under section 9 any of this particular clauses if it is taxable under section 9 your 15 cb will have to mention that what is the tax liability what is the tds with rate which is applicable uh all uh, we can go into each topic business connection itself is a quite a big area property in india asset or source of india transfer so i'll just quickly browse through this so what is business connections so any any non resident having any income through a business connection india is taxable in india when it says business connection through a person in india you need to have an authority to conclude contract so there are criteria to determine whether the business connection exists whether that income is through a business connection it could be through having authority to conclude the contract so if if i am an in, in india and i have an authority to conclude contracts on behalf of a non resident that means the income because of those contracts entered any income which has been accrued to a non resident would be taxable in india once it becomes taxable in india obviously withholding tax provisions will apply that's more important who habitually maintain stock of goods on behalf of non residents habitually secures orders and so and so forth so there may be a lot of criteria whenever you are looking into any such payments you need to understand whether those income has been derived because of business connection in india of course purely purchasing of goods for the purpose of the export so if somebody has been engaged over here to purchase goods and ultimately export to the non resident that would not be covered under the business connections so there are a lot of other explanations by way of proviso certain areas have been removed from the business connections uh, case laws of course uh, i request the committees if this can be shared uh, with the members so this is only for the purpose of uh, uh, reference in the future any property in india any income which agree arises from any property in india movable immovable tangible or intangible would be deemed to arise in india asset or source of income in india source any source as i mentioned so these are the important areas which are covered in 9 subsection 1 itself transfer of capital asset in india if any cap, any shares the shares held in the private limited company of india by a non resident if they have been transferred just wonder if they are uh, a company incorporated in india the shareholder is residing in netherlands and he transfer the shares from a netherlands shareholder transfer the shares to somebody in usa whether it would be taxable in india yes it would be taxable and now this was under a dispute but it has been after that the law has been amended after a well known case of vodafone which says that in case the value of the shares the 50% of the value of the shares is derived from an asset located in india so agar 100 rupees ki share ki value hai 
लेकिन उसकी फिफ्टी रुपीज की जो वैल्यू आ रही है सौ रुपए में इज बिकॉज ऑफ दी असेट सिचुएटेड इन इंडिया इट वुड बी टैक्सेबल सो टेक्निकली अ शेयर ट्रांसफर हैपनिंग ऑफ एन इंडियन कंपनी बिटवीन अ टू नॉन रेसिडेंट शेयर होल्डर्स बिटवीन अ शेयर होल्डर्स यू मे नॉट कम ऑल्सो like sweden shareholder is selling it to an us shareholder only the company is in india or it may be a step down subsidiary also still it would be taxable in india that's what it is so substantially this is applicable in case of 10 more than 10 crores and if the 50% of the value of all assets owned by the company registered outside india is derived from india relaxation salary dividend uh, it was very important because day in day out law of uh, non residents when you file a return of income obviously in most of the cases there would be a dividend income arising i am obviously we are paying tax on that but please whenever you are paying tax on it if is a resident of ua usa please look into it because there is a concessional tax rates available in case of dividend depending upon the resi residential status of that particular individual generally what happens is we may file a return we may include all dividend and it may get tax at a particular slab rate you may tax it at 20% 25% but you have a dtwa available to that if is a resident of ua if is a resident of usa you may have to look into that and apply that concessional rate interest royalty fts again important it's taxable it will be always deemed to accrue or arise in india if it is paid by person resident in india it is taxable in all cases so these are the certain criteria which i don't want to go into deep individual as i said each topic may take two hours if you keep on discussing that so it's only a brief by in section 9 i thought it would be important to cover in the short period of time is because only our responsibility for issuance of 15 cb arises for all such payment and it becomes very important for us when we are certifying 15 cb please mind it we are responsible for issuing that particular certificate though it's an opinion there may be a two different opinions if your opinion goes wrong obviously it's not a important aspect but when you are giving an opinion obviously you need to look into the agreements look into a documents kahi bar maine dekha hai ki payments ho jate invoice aa jata hai we are issuing the 15 cb form without actually understanding what is the nature of that amount in that particular invoice whether there is a contract whether there is any agreement entered into it and whether that would be taxable under section 9 if it is taxable under section 9 whether i can get any relief under dtwa if i can get a relief under dtwa though it is taxable under 9 dtwa provisions will override and you may get a benefit of it so the royalty i'll skip the definitions and fts i try to cover two important uh, aspects which is the new thing which is coming in very important why it is important to understand that where the international tax is moving every country worldwide wants to tax their citizens of india or the countries which are resident in their countries or which they are doing an effective substantial we say economic substances exist in that particular country they wants to tax but what is happening let's take an example i may have a country where in the overall uh, indian company may have a subsidiary oh i'll just so i have another note i try to finish it only very shortly if an indian company has a subsidiary in ue which is not paying a tax at all so what does it says my average tax rate of an indian company on a consolidated basis or on a group basis i would be paying less than 15% so whichever entity is resident of a particular country if they are paying less than 50 percent on their global income then the oecd pillar 2 model will be coming in wherein global minimum tax of 15 percent would be applicable so if i may have an operations in a tax havens the idea behind is that you should not get a benefit of those tax particular havens tax havens you should get a benefit of minimum tax would be levied at the 15 percent last uh, very important in international taxation scopes for chartered accountants you can issue an audit report in form ccb which is the requirement of transfer pricing audit while preparing a transfer pricing audit you have to determine arms length price which cannot be done without a proper transfer pricing study issuance of audit report and doing a transfer pricing study are two different generally a transfer pricing study is considered to be a management activity which can be done by the chartered accountants they can help it once you get a transfer pricing study report based on that you have to issue a 3cb that's an audit report determining arms length price 
advanced pricing agreements, you can help you into them, assistance in entering and negotiating APAs, tax treaties, interpretation of tax treaties, equilation, levy, structuring and return filing of e-commerce operators. It's a very big thing, which could be in another area. Withholding tax compliance, day in, day out, we are doing it, but I think so, we are not making revenue on that. Though we are issuing 15 CB, we are charging 1,500, considering it as a routine exercise. But when I look at it, no big companies, no big cores would be charging 1,500, 2,500 or 5,000. They would not charge less than 25,000 or 50,000 because they consider each certificate as a separate legal opinion. They examine each and every areas of that. Non-residents taxation, advising on that, other areas could be cross-border mergers and acquisitions, structuring of FDIs, FEMA, you can always rope in FEMA along with it, you can advise along with FEMA because it goes for every cross-border transactions, income tax as well as FEMA is applicable, give cities an area which is coming up new. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, I hope I have been able to do justice in whatever limited time I had. Uh, but the idea was just to give a curtain razor to it. And thank you very much. If anybody has any questions, I'll take. Thank you.